what my gifting was on being an evangelist and not a pastor of one certain place. There you go, bro. So that's always a difficulty in itself, just being obedient to the Lord and what he's called you to do, even though you might have opportunities to step into other things, even though it's it's an opportunity and it's for the Lord and glorifying the Lord. But still, if it's not what you're called to do and you're stepping out just because it's an opportunity for him and not being obedient to what he says, um, that's a struggle. Because anyone, when they have opportunities to do things that's going to be glorifying to the Lord, you want to jump off. You know, I mean, you want to do those things, but not running out in front of the Lord and, you know, outrunning him and letting him go first and prepare the way. I believe it will always end up being better that way. But I would like to uh, pray before we get into the word. Uh, Lord, I just uh, bless your name. We just want to exalt and magnify your name in this house tonight, Lord. Jesus, we want you to be famous in here. We thank you for your presence and the way that you're going to show up. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you open up spiritual ears and spiritual eyes as we go into this word. We acknowledge that you are our teacher, the spirit of truth, who will reveal this word to us and allow it to become flesh in our lives. And Father God, I just thank you for you being the most high God and allowing us to be here on this night together. And I just uh, thank you for all the saints that came in here on this Sunday night and ask that you will bless them and bless me, allow me to get out of the way decrease so you may increase Lord and we just love you and praise you in Jesus name amen, amen. amen. all right I think uh, gonna preach on expectation so really it's just whatever notes I got going on at the time when someone calls and can you come speak or come do whatever that's usually just what I roll with because I know the Lord has me preparing that for the next or wherever it's going to be, obviously, I, that was on my heart preparing it for a reason. Um, although, I, um, I kind of just want to tell a little bit about my past, just for anyone in here that maybe not may have not known yet or whatever, and it also goes along with this word of expectation, but I went through Teen Challenge, so it's a Christian discipleship program, uh, like three, probably about three years ago, and even years before that was in the heavy addiction and addicted to heroin and using intravenous drug use, you know, needles and all that stuff, and the Lord pulled me out of that, and I went to that Christian discipleship program, but while we was there, there was always this worship that was in, uh, I forget what town it was in, but it was, it was a real good worship, and I remember when I first got there, all the guys would start pumping it up and talking about it, like, wait till we go to Justin Boyle's church, bro, I mean, this worship's off the hook, it's gonna be this, it's gonna be that. Like you're always hearing people talk about it. So by the time we got there, our expectation was built up to when we stepped into that worship. There was already a difference in the environment. No matter no, and I know now looking back, and I can tell in this walk that we walk with the Lord that our expectation determines the outcome of what we're stepping into a lot of times. So it's like even like when we have revival or we had the DOXA conference and stuff like that. There was anointed men of God there, but I believe we can have that environment all the time every time we step in. But it's when there's a conference or a revival set up or, you know, special evangelist set up, your expectation when you're getting ready to walk in is already at a different level than just a normal Wednesday or Sunday or Sunday night service. Because you're like, all right, this is the con this is the DOXA conference or this is revival. The Lord's going to be there because this is revival. But really, I believe if we walk around with that expectation all the times in our heart, the Lord's going to show up, not only when we step into the house of God, but in, in situations that we're praying for, that we have that expectation that he's going to move on our behalf. So I, it's always been something that's been on my heart, but it's, I've never really got it down on paper or like got into scriptures. But I knew even in a, being a, in my early Christian walk at Teen Challenge, like when you start getting yourself pumped up for these situations, when you walk in, the whole atmosphere is different. God never changes. Jesus never changes. If you draw near to him, we'll draw near to you. He's always been the same and he's always going to be that way. But it's our, the, the nature of our heart and what we're walking in there inspecting is going to determine on how we connect with him in that given moment. So uh, Romans 8.25, I think we might have that one for the board. But if 
we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And as some versions say, with patience. So it's like you don't hope for what you can see because then it later on goes to talk in Romans chapter 8, like a man does not hope for what he can see. And I was telling my son that he went without his phone and broke his phone unless he was saying something about like his, uh, his brother on his uh, he has a different father when he goes over to his mom's. He's like, he's saying, how can I, how do I know that the church, you know, the church is real and Jesus is real and the word of God is real. And I was able to use this verse to him and tell him like, you know, the same thing with, uh, you, you hope for what you cannot see because once you see things, then you don't want to hope for it no more. It's like your phone, when it was broken, you hoped you could get a new phone. You wanted a new phone. That was always on your mind. I want that new phone. I want that new phone. I want that new phone. Then when you get the phone in your hand, then you start going on to other things. Jesus got, you know, we're locked into his presence and his glory and what we're hoping for because we're always wanting to strive to get there. We're always wanting to, you know, see him and see his face and be with him. So the more that we got that hope built in us and a biblical hope is something that's built on the word of God. You know, it's an assurance that you know is there because the word of God says it's there. So a biblical hope is different than like what a world's hope is, even though I gave him a worldly example. You know, you might say, I hope Buckeyes win the national championship. I hope the Cleveland Browns win one game. Or I hope, you know, <laughs> got to my first amen. <laughs> Dude. Um, but, you know, when you hope for things of the Lord and you hope for what you read in the, the Bible, you know that those things are going to come to pass because that's what the Word of God says. Uh, me and my wife was out to eat yesterday because next Saturday I'm performing the wedding for my cousin and her fiance so i'm going to be actually you know holding that ceremony and he was saying man this is crazy like the things i know your past from her and where you're at now like i don't see guys that was in that walk like be where you're at how how is it and i was like it's just simply because of my relationship with jesus that's all that's the only reason why i'm you know where i'm at right now and so and he was like well give examples like i know you're saying a relationship but what changed you know what's been the difference and i'm like the major thing that came to me was like realizing that the Bible is an infallible word of God. Like what the scriptures say, if you do those things, that you'll achieve the results that they say you'll achieve. Before, I mean, I've read the Bible and stuff, but it was like reading a book. I was just reading the word, you know, I would read through it, thumb through it, read or whatever, but it never carried no weight to me like it does now compared to this is a holy thing when I get in here and I honor the word of God. And I know when the word of God says something that has promises, I believe that that's what it's going to say. Like, I actually believe and know that that's, you know, that is the word. And if you do those things, certain results is going to follow. And if you don't do those things, they're not going to follow. And you've got to have that faith and that hope that when you're reading that, that those things will happen in your life. So you're not just reading, you know. I think that's the problem with a lot of, you know, us Christians these days is, you, you know, you'll come into churches and sermons and the pastor has four bullet point notes or five bullet point notes. And you write them down, but I, and I went in, I was in Teen Challenge, I did thousands of chapels, and I wrote it down every time, but how many times did I actually follow up on those bullet points that I wrote down? I mean, it's nice sitting there writing them down in church and stuff like that, but how many times did I go back and pray and say, Holy Spirit, how can I apply this into my life, and how can, so what I'm saying is, is once we realize that the scripture needs to become flesh in our life, and if we, you can have education and read it, and it's just like a book, but if you don't have application, it's not an education thing, we can all read the word but it's an application thing like when you apply those scriptures to your life that's when that expectation and you start to see like just like working out like a muscle you know the more you exercise your faith the bigger it gets but until you actually put scriptures in the application and use them in your life you're not growing stronger in your faith because you're just you know you're reading it you're saying it and you can even read quote scriptures and say scriptures but if you're not actually doing the application of what the word says in your life and it's not going to, you know, you're not going to get filled up in that faith. And Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith it's impossible to please God. So you, you got, I mean, you have to have faith that when you say things, you know, when you quote those scriptures or try to apply them to your life, that it's actually going to be there and it's gonna, actually going to come to pass. And that's kind of a strong statement because there's not many times in the Bible where you read a statement like that. Like, 
without this, it's impossible to please God. So, I mean, that's how big, you know, faith is and hope is a component of faith, on, you know, linking those things together. I think really on the notes, I kind of got off on a little side tangent there. But, yeah, preaching, trying to. But uh, basically, it's just like always on my heart, though, because even for myself, even though I like to go through the Bible and quote scriptures and, you know, read the scriptures, but how many times am I actually putting that application into my life and actually trying to apply that scripture to my life and actually walking in it? And actually, when I was in Teen Challenge, I had a chance to leave after the first four months, even though it was 14 months. And of course, my beautiful wife that's here right now in the front row, she was my girlfriend at the time. And I was sending letters to her and my mom. And of course, I'm putting scriptures in every letter, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit fluent in the Bible and thinking I'm a man, like I can quote all kinds of scriptures. And they're all like, oh, it's time for you to come home. You know, these letters are full of the word of God and scripture. So even after four months, they're like, you're good to come home. You know, you don't need that next 10 months. But I was reading scripture and stuff like a faith without action is a dead faith. And, you know, should the hyperbole Jesus uses about you should uh, hate your mother, your father, your children, even hate yourself if you want to be my disciple, where it talks about in Luke 14, even though he's using hate as a love less, basically. So you should love all those people less than me. And I'm reading scriptures like seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. And I'm like, I'm not coming home. I'm gonna finish this program. You can like let my house go, let the car go. Uh, even though I could have got my son right off the bat when I got back into town, and I was like, I, I'm believing what I'm reading. If this is true, then this is gonna happen. And then I went back up to my room and got by myself. It's like, what I just do? I had just left this place, man. My girl was cool with it. My mom was cool with it. What a out! I mean, if you got your mom and your girl cool with the decision, you're golden. You know, I could have just been home and. Got, been back with my son and not been away from me for 10 more months, but I ended up staying through the program. And by the time I got out, um, my wife uh, had moved into the house and had new carpet put in and electronics all in the house. I had sold everything, pawned everything for drugs. Um, my car was paid off. My house was still there. I had a beautiful wife waiting in it for me. My son, all I had to literally do is step foot in a mansfield and sign paperwork to become a residential parent. Which if I would have made that decision and outran God though and not stayed and been obedient and exercised my faith, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And plus it grew those faith muscles strong to be able to believe that when I put these uh, scriptures and the application into my life, this is the result that follows from them. I wouldn't have been blessed enough if I had came home and outran that. So we're going to travel over. Speaking of expectation, in the Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 25. I'm going to start. So this is where Jesus walks on the Sea of Tiberias, or also you know, known as the Sea of Galilee. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And that's a good key, just stopping there, just to look in the life of Jesus when you read through the Gospels, though, and just try to pick up the characteristics how Jesus did things. He would always make time to get off by himself and pray. Because, you know, that's where the power comes through. When we, make, when we can make time to get by ourselves and actually have a prayer life with just us and Jesus in this busy world, that's where that power comes from. And he demonstrates, I mean, with him being our role model, we can take a lot of things out of just reading the little parts. And as we're reading through the word, let the Holy Spirit just kind of reveal those things to us and teach us. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. Then I'm going to travel over to John chapter 21, starting at the beginning of the chapter. This is where they're out on the boat trying to fish. They see, see Jesus on the shore. So 
After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you. Also, they went out and immediately got into the boat that night they caught nothing but when the morning had now come Jesus stood on the shore yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus then Jesus said to them children have you any food they answered him no and he said to them cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some so they cast and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter it is the Lord now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciple came in a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So both of those scenarios, the disciples was in trouble. The one, you know, they was out in the middle of the sea of Tiberias, which uh, Tiberius literally translates into good vision. Good vision. So the first time Jesus walked on the water to their knees, and then that second time, Jesus was on the shore, and they had to come to him. If you expect Jesus to do it the same way every time, you will miss him most of the time. That's good. So, you know, speaking about the expectation, the first time Jesus walked on the water to them, the second time they had to come to Jesus on the shore. So we can't just by our previous you know, experiences in life, the way that Jesus has showed up, we can't expect him to show up that way every time, the same way every time, or we're going to miss him a lot of the times. Jesus will show up in your difficulties and your problems and in different ways every time. Sometimes he comes to you, sometimes you got to come to him, but the, the basics of this is your, your expectations can't fall into the patterns of your experience, and your expectations always have to be in Jesus. Expectation. This, this thing's always been about Jesus, and it's always going to be about Jesus. A lot of times people ask me, you know, what to do and when they're struggling and stuff like that. And it's like, fall in love with Jesus. You want him more than anything else you want in the world. And one, I mean, a lot of times, like, you know, Jordan was speaking about up here when he was leading the worship. It's your proximity to the Lord is the fix for your problems. So the closer you are to Jesus and when you can see him when you got him near to you, then a lot of your problems seem to get farther. The closer, the closer Jesus is, the farther away your problems are. Amen. Then we're going to go to over to Acts chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them, with John, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. So this man who was begging alms was expecting to receive silver or gold or something in those times and days that when they was laid there at the, you know, begging alms, that's basically what they were looking, looking for was finances. 
But Peter and John walking up knew that they had something for this guy, and it was Jesus because of their close relationship with Jesus. They had so much Jesus in them and on them, I can only imagine. I mean, that's Acts chapter 3. We all know what happened in Acts chapter 2, right? So these guys, you know what I mean? They're like, oh, it's on. We got filled with the Holy Ghost. Came out. I was running a couple nights ago. Now I'm preaching one of the greatest sermons ever, adding multitudes unto the kingdom. And now I'm walking up and see this dude who needs a healing, you know? I mean, I'm, I bet Peter is just like, oh, it's on. I see this dude laying down at the gate. He needs some Jesus. But it says that guy looked up expecting to receive something. Even though he was expecting to receive something financially, his expectation already had him prepared for the healing that he was about to get because he was expecting to receive something. I love when I see little things like that in the Bible, just a little sentence here or there, the way I've never thought about it, and the Holy Spirit just reveals it. Like It shows like our inclination leads to expectation. That's what I wrote down on that. Inclination leads to expectation. I know one of one of the verses I've got on my calendar at work, it says, uh, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to seek selfish gain. And the Lord was just kind of showing me in my prayer time if I've been meditating on that verse, just to, when we incline ourselves that we're ready to receive that water to overflow compared to being declined and seeking selfish gain. The water just runs downhill, the living water. But if we're inclined and got our eyes looking up towards the holy hill and going towards the Lord, that's positioning in ourselves to be able to receive from the Lord. That same way that, the, you know, that I'll read this one more time now that we've said that. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then I, I and then obviously we know how it goes on, how Peter says, you know, silver nor gold do I have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man jumps up and starts leaping and they go throughout the temple and everyone's glorifying the Lord because they had all walked past that man. They had all seen that man there for years. But a lot of times in the church, you know, we're, we're okay with walking past people that, uh -oh, this is a, talk about. all right, all right, all right, Jordan. This ain't in the notes, but this just came. How many times with us coming to church and, you know, knowing that we know the Lord, are we okay with walking past people who's lame and who have problems and who is laying there while we're walking into the house of God, feeling good about ourselves because we're not as messed up as that man? How many men knew the Lord that maybe could have gave that guy a touch or maybe, you know, tried to help that man besides just giving him money? You know, it's okay for us to just give money and think that we're helping people or when the missionaries come to preach and we give the money and, you know, we're doing our part. But, you know, there's a mission field right out here, right outside our door, right outside our cities with everyone needing and groaning and eager expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that, you know, that we're supposed to, you know, be in such a close contact and relationship with Jesus that when we come in contact with people, that they're coming in contact with Jesus. And that's who changes situations. And that's who raises the lane. And that's who, you know, makes the addict become a regular functioning member of society and who makes the prostitute get a regular line of work and not do those things. <clears throat> and then I got written on here, this is a, one of the revelations I kind of got, but it's exaltation plus expectation equals manifestation. So when we exalt the name of the Lord and we exalt Jesus above everything else in our life and we're expecting him to move or expecting his presence every time we walk in or expecting every time we pray that he's moving our behalf or expecting every time I come in contact with someone at work or someone in society that they're going to have Jesus. That's when the manifestation occurs. Because you're exalting the Lord, you're expecting it to happen, and then the manifestation and the way he shows up will occur if you're doing those things. Expect the Lord to show up, not a great preacher or evangelist, or a great worship leader. When the church strives for greatness, it has brought the world's values into the church. So if I'm always, you know, even my, me, myself, I have to check myself a lot. Do I need to prepare so much so I got everything down packed to the perfect precision, pinpoint accuracy, and talk like I got a PhD or like I'm some theologian up here, which I'm not. 
I'm just an evangelist who try to submit and get out of my flesh and walk according to the spirit so the Lord can speak through me. Or, you know, my worship where I practice so much, I just want to have the excellence of every key you're doing, you know, uh, vocal acrobatics and all kinds of great things to get the crowd involved. Or do I know that it's not me, that it's Jesus, that once my flesh is dead and once I'm out of the way and I'm crucified with Christ and I die daily and can't do this thing in my own flesh, that walking according to the spirit will produce the results that people feel and that, that change people and change environments. When we try to do things like I want everything to be so great and everything to be so practiced and precision performed that we're bringing the values that the world says you've got to be great at everything. You need to be so prepared for everything that everything goes on without a hitch instead of letting the Holy Ghost run the service and, you know, take over because we're not trying to be great in our own flesh that we're just trying to get out of the way and be dead. That way the Lord can take over and walk according to the Spirit. But that's a lot of things that's going on these days, and we're wondering why people are coming into churches and walking out the same way that they came in. Because we got the smoke machines and the big screens and all kinds of excellent shows going on, and it's almost just like a, a theatrical review, the way that you can walk in downtown. You know, you walk in, what's that place called downtown where they have the place? Renaissance. Renaissance Theater, there you go. You know, you got the people with the mask up on stage performing one way, but then when they walk out, they're doing another thing. And also the crowd coming in, you know, you're coming to watch the show, but then when you walk back out, you're just a regular participant, participant in a civilian life, you know, but this thing ain't supposed to be like that. It's not about 